like a good morning. <clears throat> Last week we talked a little bit about the introduction of uh, overview of who is this Jesus Christ. And uh, as we just sort of look at the, uh, in the next few weeks, we're just looking at the early days of his life and the very beginnings of his ministry. All extremely significant uh, issues that we want to uh, sort through, all of them having aspects from which we can learn and apply truth to our lives. But, but more than that, it's, it really answers the questions. Last week we said, why should we even study the life of Christ? And we, we see that that is the whole cornerstone of what our Christianity is all about, is this life of Jesus Christ. And and we saw that uh, the Gospels give us a fourfold witness to the person of Christ. Uh, we see him as our as servant and savior, as God and savior, as king and savior, and man and savior. And that's Mark, John, Matthew, and Luke in that particular order. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, but all four of those Gospels emphasize the issue of savior. I mean, I was hearing, and I can't remember where I read it, whether it was in a prayer letter or something else, but again, uh, just a, a little statement about the fact that as we wrestle with the things we're with, that a lot of people just can't wait till things are back to normal. But the truth of the matter is, is that abnormality is normality in a fallen world. And that life really as much as we want it to be normal and peaceful and organized, the reality of life is that it's filled with ups and downs and difficulties and trials and testings and, and struggles and, and problems and all because we live in a fallen world. But what we're focusing on here is the very truth of the one who came into this world to meet us in our fallen condition, in order to touch our lives and help us to recognize how fallen we are as individuals and how desperately we need the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. And when we find Him, then it doesn't matter how abnormal circumstances may appear around us. Life is rich, overflowing, and full simply because we have him that makes all the difference in the world so one of the things we want to pay attention to are the eight questions that we started with last week when did he come chronology where did he come geography what did he do his miracles and life example what did he say his teachings and claims why did he come his purpose and expectation how was he received? The response of men. What difference did he make? The lives he touched. And what does he offer me? The contemporary relevance of this life of Christ that was born into this world went to the cross of Calvary, dead, buried, and risen again for our salvation. And so that's where we want to focus. And last week we, we simply talked about the fact that Christ was pre-existing in eternity. And we looked at the first 18 verses of John and reminding ourselves about this one who uh, came as the messenger of bringing a bearer, excuse me, of grace and truth to the world. And Christ, who came into this world, is the messenger of grace. And he brings the message of grace, to believe on the name of the Son of God, to have the authority to become the children of God. And then also, the one who actually brings to us the very provision of grace. That he alone is the provider. He is the source of all grace for living in this fallen world. So that brings us to the arrival of the king, the introduction of the king, the very arrival. And of course, when we want to talk about his arrival, we, we want to take two steps into the genealogies. And as we saw uh, last week, Matthew begins uh, with the seed of Abraham and David, as it's written to a focus more to Israel. Um, 
John, we saw, showed the Lord as eternally preexistent. And then Luke is going to show his seed all the way uh, to Adam because Luke's emphasis is man and Savior, Matthew, king and Savior. So it begins with Israel's uh, existence as a nation through Abraham uh, and then the lineage of the king uh, from David. And of course, John we already looked at. And then Mark, of course, as we said last week, Mark has no lineage. But the portrait of Christ in the book of Mark is more uh, the idea of servant and savior, no lineage. But let's look at Matthew chapter 1. We're just going to take a few verses out of Matthew 1. But in, in verse 1, it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judas and his brother. And Judas begot Phares and Zerah of Thamar. And then skip uh, down to verse 5. And Salmon begot Boaz of Rahab. And Boaz begot Obed of Ruth. And Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David the king. And David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. And then uh, we'll flip through verses 7 and 15 and then pick it up in, in verse 16. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. Well, why is this important? Well, it's significant because understanding this particular genealogy in Matthew helps us to understand several things regarding the person of Christ himself. R. R. Wilson uh, said this about linear genealogy. It serves to ground a claim to power, status, rank, office, or inheritance in an earlier ancestor. And so what we find is that this particular genealogy helps us to understand that Jesus is rooted in David. And one of the things that the genealogy brings out, which sometimes we don't often think about when we talk about the Christmas story, is that Joseph was literally a legal heir to the throne of Israel. Now, no king had sat upon the throne of Israel for over 14 generations. But the genealogy still continued, and Joseph was a legal heir to the throne. And so the insignificance of this regarding the Lord Jesus Christ is he is first of all seen as the seed of Abraham. And of course, to Abraham was given the promise of a seed that by all nations would be blessed. And he's seen as the legal and the royal heir to the throne of Israel by way of David, through Solomon, and I think it's significant that it's through Solomon to Joseph. This mere carpenter was rightful heir to the throne of David. But the religious system of Israel had long since uh, degenerated into a political mishmash with Rome. And so it was Israel was run by appointed rulers uh, in favor with the Roman government. And it really no longer followed the significant issues of the kingly genealogy. But we also saw in this particular genealogy that jo uh, David, excuse me, Jesus is seen as the son, but not of the seed of Joseph. And that's really interesting because it's very specific here where it says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called the Christ. But notice the word begot is left out of the genealogy. And the, the issue is, is that Joseph did not beget Jesus, but yet Jesus is the firstborn son of Joseph. So that solidifies his claim as legal heir to the throne of Israel. But he's not the seed of Joseph. And so Joseph then was the father, but not the procreator of Jesus. 
And so when we talk about Israel, though, why is this genealogy significant? We find that regarding Israel, it shows the preservation of the seed of promise through 42 generations. God never lost sight of his promises through 42 generations. And in those 42 generations, I mean there were lots of ups and downs, there were lots of attempts to, to uh, rid the, the kingdom of the, of the proper lineage of the line, and yet always God was preserving that seed of promise. And so there was always someone there that would carry the torch of the seed of promise and the royal throne of Israel. And so it shows the preservation of that seed of promise, but it also shows the preservation of God's promises to Israel through 42 generations. God never lost sight of his promises to this people despite 42 generations, again, of incredible up and down history of captivities and being in bondage and even literally ripped out of the land. But still, despite the issues of Babylon, Assyria, and then later Greece, and, and then Rome, we find that God was still at work behind the scenes, still preserving his people through it all. But then right in the middle of that genealogy, though, we also find this inclusion of the names of Rahab, Tamar, Ruth, and Bathsheba. I remember uh, when um, a while back, Pastor Paul did a, a little thing on the genealogies of Jacob, you know, and the family uh, involved, and what a scandalous family it was. And of course, this is again the emphasis. Why? Why? Because normally they don't even put the women's names in genealogy. But yet, God specifically did record these four women. And all of them, in one sense or another, were involved in scandalous relationships and difficulties. Now we know Ruth was a heroine, as you look at the book of Ruth, but she was also a Moabite. And a Moabite, uh, of all the women, we, we find that they weren't supposed to be allowed in uh, with ten generations uh, into the into the people of Israel because of some of the conflicts that were involved there. Well, those four women all testify to the fallenness of people, and especially even the nation of Israel, highlighting their need of a savior by the inclusion of the scandalous background of their nation and the issues that were involved. And of course, the issues got even worse. And even though it doesn't mention any of the other women from this point forward, we know that as you go through all of the kings, only three or four of the kings are even mentioned at all as having some good in them, but even the one that was closest to God's heart wound up committing adultery and murder. And so the very inclusion of these women shows Israel the grace of God in their preservation as a nation through those 42 generations. God, really, they, Israel did not merit their preservation, but the grace of God still always went back to the promises of God. But when we think about these women, the thing that always strikes me is we talk about, well, how does this relate to us? Uh, to me, it's an awesome reminder that if God did not lose sight of his purposes in Israel and the seed of promise over 42 generations, God never loses sight of his purposes for our lives. Though the darkness of a moment may give that appearance to us, we want to many times say, oh God, where are you? <laughs> And he's, he's always there. And he's never losing sight of his purposes. And we can trust him. But also, as God was unashamed to include these women into his ancestry list of Christ, he literally brought the Lord Jesus Christ into the world through these four women of shame. 
But if God is unashamed to include these women in the genealogy, it, it helps us to understand that God delights in using us, regardless of our past, to bring him into the world. Regardless of our fallenness, God who physically was willing to bring the, the very person of Christ and his humanity into the world, through sinners, has given us an even higher privilege of bringing him spiritually into this world, though fallen and broken by the world and by the sin of Adam. So then we move to the second genealogy, and the second genealogy is in Luke chapter 3. And I'm just going to again look at a couple verses here. But I want you to notice that in in the genealogy of Matthew, it's clear Joseph did not beget Christ. And it's also clear in Luke chapter 3. And Jesus himself, verse 23, in Luke 3, verse 23, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, and notice the parenthesis, as was supposed the son of Joseph. And my understanding is, is that parenthesis could just as easily have been through all of that, but as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which who was the son of Heli. And so you take that parenthesis out there, Jesus began to be about 30 years of age, being the son of Heli. Now here it doesn't mention the women in the genealogy. And there are a lot of different uh, viewpoints as to why the genealogies are somewhat different. But I believe, simply as you look at the testimony of the first couple chapters of Matthew, and then you look at the first couple chapters of the book of Luke, it's very obvious that one is telling us the genealogy of Joseph, the other is telling us the genealogy of Mary. But Mary herself is not mentioned here. But that it is a distinctly different genealogy here uh, tells us because the son of David is not Solomon in this in this particular genealogy, it's Nathan. And so we find that Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli. Uh, and then we go up to, uh, go down to verse 31, which was the son of Malia, which was the son of Menon, which was the son of Madara, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David, which was the son of Jesse. And then the genealogies are fairly similar again. And then we go, but then this genealogy goes beyond Abraham. And in verse 38, the genealogy says, which was also the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. In the sense that again, we go back to the very beginning where God created man. And so the genealogy of Luke follows a slightly different branch, a lot of similarity, but the similarities are basically, especially from Abraham down uh, through David, but then uh, there are a lot more differences as you get all the way down to Heli. And I believe, again, you will find, although I could never, I wouldn't die on this rock, but I believe that Heli was the father of Mary. In which case, then, we've, we look at that genealogy. But so the man is given the last issue as far as where the genealogy goes. But it's interesting, as we look at this particular genealogy, why is this significant in the Gospel of Luke? Uh, and we, we find that it shows his descent, number one, from Adam, emphasizing his humanity and relationship to all mankind. There is only one race. That is so hard for us to comprehend. That humanity is, this, is basically there's only one race of humanity. Now there are a lot of ethnic differences. But every human being on the face of the earth can trace their lineage back. And it will trace it back to Adam. And so all of mankind goes back there. All of mankind was fallen. Which is why, again, Jesus came into the world. 
But it also, again, as I say, shows by the wording of the text that Joseph is not the procreator of Christ, being as was supposed of Joseph, but literally of Heli. And so the genealogy continues down. And it takes us, as I say, a different seed, but when you look at the context of Luke chapter 1 it's, and Luke chapter 2, it's all about Mary. And the very birth of Christ to this particular woman. Well, is that even significant? Well, it is, number one, because Jesus had to be of the seed of David. And there's no question that the genealogy of Luke is the seed of David. And so, again, Christ is literally the seed of David through Nathan. But he had to come through Joseph to be royal heir to the throne. But why, why have the two distinct genealogies? Because in Jeremiah 22, verses 24 to 30, God placed a curse on Jeconiah and said that no seed of this man will ever prosper on the throne of Israel. And from that point on, the lineage of the kings lost power, never again to sit on the throne. And so Christ then becomes the legal heir to the throne through Joseph, but he is not the seed of Jeconiah. But he is the seed of David through Mary. Those things really wrap, uh, place those genealogies together very well. So Jesus is heir to the throne through Joseph and the seed of David through Mary. But then regarding us, he is shown to be a man who in his humanity can fully identify with our infirmities and our needs. And the scriptures tell us that over and over again, the Lord Jesus Christ tested in all points like as we get without sin. That we can come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need through that one who can identify with our needs. So, Moving from the two genealogies, then we go into his advent and we get to the annunciation of his birth, uh, the birth of John to Zechariah. And so in chapter, Luke chapter 1, we begin to read in verse 5 of Luke chapter 1. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abbey, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared to them an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And then he gives several more statements about this son. And then in verse 18, And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed. Because thou believe not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And then in verse 23. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed into his own house. And after those days did his wife Elizabeth conceive, and, bit, and he hid himself five months, saying, Thus has the Lord dealt with me in the days where he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. Several things in that little passage that I, I want to focus on 
and first and foremost are the names Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now I can't and won't die on a stone that every name that has its meanings is necessarily that significant to a passage, but there's no question that Zechariah and Elizabeth are. Many names, as I say, have incredible significance in Scripture, and Zechariah's name literally means the Lord remembers. And Elizabeth, her name literally means oath or covenant. And so here you have Zechariah and Elizabeth together. The Lord remembers his oath and his covenant. God had made incredible promises in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 40, Malachi chapter 3, about the forerunner that would come before the Lord, that would prepare the way of the Lord. And so now the very concept of the Lord remembers his oath or covenant, that by itself and the miraculous nature of the, of the conceiving of John tells you the, this incredible reality of truth. That yes, God was very specifically the time had come for him to bring forth what his covenants have been promising since Adam and Eve. The seed of promise. It was coming. And of course, he's to name his son John, which is Jehovah, is gracious. God is gracious. God remembered his oath, his covenant. Now, it's not like God forgot it. That's not the issue here. But it's the issue that it's, it's here. That God has never forgotten His covenant. And that's what we've seen through 42 generations in Matthew. God never forgot. And it always preserving the seed of promise. But now, at last, the, the moment, the pivotal point, point of all of Israel's history has taken place. So obviously Zechariah was a priest, that means he was a Levite. And Gabriel brings in that miraculous revelation of John's birth and ministry, uh, which, let me just read uh, these particular Old Testament passages for you. The first one uh, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. But this is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And then you, we go to the Malachi, the last book of the Bible, the last book of the Old Testament, excuse me, and in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even, and here it is, the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. That God had remembered his oath or covenant, John preparing the way, the messenger, that would bring the one, that would be the fulfillment of his promises. And then one other statement is it was the first of four times. It's the first of four times as we talk about uh, the birth of Christ. The first of four times we find the phrase, do not be afraid. I mean, an angel just pops in. You know, there he is. Wow. I think my knees would knock. I don't know about yours, but I feel like my knees would definitely sort of knock a little bit. And yet comes the soothing confidence. Do not be afraid. And then we know Zechariah was made dumb as a sign of the truth until it came to pass. But one other thing about Elizabeth and Zechariah is that I really believe they're just illustrations of Old Testament believers found righteous before the Lord by faith. That God did have a remnant that was still looking. And we'll see that again as we get into the Gospel of Luke a little bit further. We're going to see that there are many that were looking uh, with confidence in God's promises and trusting His promises. 
but it also ended the cultural difficulty of not having an heir. And of course, and that's where he talks about this issue again of, of God bringing and helping uh, to cover the issue that they were without children. That's a major issue in that particular culture. So then in Luke chapter 1, we look at verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee, verse 26, named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, just like uh, Zechariah, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation that should be. And the angel said unto her, second time we see the statement, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And that word favor, by the way, is grace. Thou hast found grace with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, Why, well, how can this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. It's interesting, same thing the angel said to Sarah, for with God nothing is impossible. When they still had not had Abraham born unto them. So Gabriel, the messenger of God, revealer of divine purposes, makes his second appearance, and for the second time he says, do not be afraid. And by the statement of her own mouth, Mary declares herself to be a virgin. I mean, the liberals are out there and the liberals talk about, oh, we don't believe him. If you go back and look at this word virgin, it might really mean this or that. <clears throat> but folks, you can't get away from the fact that Mary comes right out and says, look, I've never known a man. So I don't care how you want to look at that word. The context tells us she was a virgin. Although the word here in the Greek literally does mean virgin. And the, the argument is more over the prophecy in Isaiah as far as what did it mean <clears throat> that a virgin shall conceive. And there's certain ramifications of that word that you may or may, may reinterpret it in certainly different ways. But you can't bypass what Mary says. I've never known a man. She's going to be empowered with the seed of Christ by the Holy Spirit. The declaration here is super clear. This is a miraculous conception. Because for with God will nothing be impossible. Why do people have problems with, a, with the virgin birth? Let me tell you. Let's look at one passage in Matthew 22. It's for the same reason that the Sadducees had a hard time with the resurrection of Christ. In Matthew 22, we simply read this. As the Sadducees bring up their issues of the resurrection and you know, saying to Moses, saying, well, what about if, you know, this woman is married to this guy, but no children and goes through seven sons, then who shall she be in the resurrection? And what they were doing is literally just ridiculing the whole idea of the resurrection. 
And Jesus answered and said unto them after their little tirade and little illustration, He said, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Let me tell you, if you know the Scriptures, you know it's declaring a virgin birth. But it's more than just the scriptures. It's not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. You see, God created the universe. God is the one who brought life into existence. God is the one who engineered all of the incredible complexity of life and birth and death. It's a little thing for God to accomplish if we really understand who God is. The problem of a virgin birth is a result of men's concept of God. It's not the miracle. The liberals who attack it have absolutely no concept of an all-powerful God. And then Elizabeth's pregnancy is given as a sign that the message will come to pass. And Mary, we know, is blessed of God with favor. It's that word grace. By the bearing of God's Son in her womb, literally. She's going to bear the flesh, the humanity that will house the incarnated Christ. But her blessing is of grace, it's not merit. Despite the exaltation of certain aspects of Christianity, that place her equal with God. She is never equal with God, and we'll see that in a moment. She's submissive, though, to the will of God. And so she says, let it be according to thy word. And I believe she was just another one of the Old Testament believers, just like Elizabeth and Zechariah. But that really becomes extremely obvious when we see her uh, conversation with Elizabeth. It's interesting that the Ave Maria is one of the most beautiful hymns ever sung, especially at Christmas time. And it goes all the way back to the 6th century. It traces back to the 6th century in some form, more popularly developed in the 16th century. But the first stanza is straight scripture. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Now years later, they added a second uh, verse to that, and um, it's not scriptural. But <clears throat> the, the concept of that song is about the most miraculous moment in the history of the world where this woman, as a virgin, conceives the incarnated God. So in many respects, I, I sort of, even though I can wrestle with the second stanza of that song, it is an incredible moment of history that God brings upon. And, you know, the estimates I've heard uh, is a very, very young uh, lady. So what are the descriptions of this Christ child, the description of the child to be born? He's great. He's son of the highest. He's going to be on his throne of his father David. He's going to reign over Jacob forever. He's going to have an unending kingdom. He's conceived by the Holy Spirit in a virgin. And he shall be the son of God. <coughs> wow. This was no ordinary birth. You wouldn't expect it to be an ordinary birth when you understand all of the scripture around it. But there's a truth here. Mary typifies the grace and the privilege of all believers to bring Christ into the world by the Holy Spirit. Now she alone is the only one in the history of the world that literally bodily brings in the incarnated Christ into the world. But every one of us who have been born again by the work of the Holy Spirit in response to our faith, every one of us, God says, can now bring forth the, the life of Jesus Christ into the world. 
I mean, I often think about it when you're, you know, you're pregnant and you get along six, seven, eight months. It's very obvious there's another life inside of you. But that's what God wants the world to see through our lives. That there's another life that lives inside of us apart from this fallen nature, this fallen flesh of ours. There's a new life, a new man, the life of Christ himself, and the world can see it. So Mary then leaves Nazareth and comes down to Judah to visit Elizabeth. And in verses 39 through 45 of Luke chapter 1, and Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zechariah and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutations of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believeth, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And so, as according to the sign, God confirmed Elizabeth's pregnancy with Mary as she goes from Nazareth down to Judah and speaks to Elizabeth who's filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaims that Mary is the mother of her Lord. <clears throat> so John and Jesus were cousins as were Mary and Elizabeth. And there's a joyous event as John literally leaps in Elizabeth's womb. Life does exist before birth regardless of all of the propaganda of today. And then Mary then responds with her anthem in verses 46 through 56. And Mary has a mixture of 17 quotes from the Old Testament, showing her incredible familiarity with Scripture. But she starts out by simply saying this in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul does magnify the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Mary was no different than any other. She also needed a Savior. She praises the Lord for all he has to her and to Israel and is mindful of her humble estate. And Mary sees God, as I say, very specifically as her Savior. It's an incredible story, but it's an incredible history. When and where did Christ come? And as we're going to see in the next lesson, we can pinpoint the locations and the approximate time in history. It's not some mythological story. It's something that literally does take place in time, space, and history. The Savior of mankind took upon himself human form, incarnate in the wound of Mary. And so we'll pick up on the birth uh, next week. Father, thank you again for this privilege of looking at your word and just being challenged with the life of Christ. Everything about this life, Lord, is miraculous, overwhelmingly amazing. But above all is the simple truth that we saw in Mary who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So also is that true of us who are willing to simply believe the promises of God's Word and to trust, Father, that Jesus, this Jesus who was born is the fulfillment of your oath, your promises. 
for the Savior of the world. We ask it for Christ's sake.